Welcome to Mintel's Little Conversation podcast. Hello and welcome to Mintel's Little Conversation, where our experts bring you fresh ideas and new perspectives on how consumers eat, drink, shop, groom and think. My name's Deb Cuny. I'm a manager in Mintel's in-house consulting team and today an eager guest presenter. We're going to be talking in this episode about the age-old battle of science versus nature. When it comes to what consumers want and why, how much are people willing to embrace new inventive solutions and how do they see those in relation to the natural world? Now, luckily, my job here is purely to convince the podcast producers that I deserve a regular spot and the legwork is going to be done by today's guest analysts. So guys, please introduce yourselves. You guys will have heard me before. Um, it's Edward Bergen here, massive hummus fanatic, global food and drink analyst. Done this a few times before. It's quite fun sitting in the guest uh, position, but looking forward to hearing Depp's performance. Hi, I'm Alex Fisher. I am the Associate Director of Beauty and Personal Care here over at Mintel. Uh, been on a couple of these podcasts before, but uh, never quite in this situation of recording it at home. Always been lucky enough to be in the studio. So looking forward to this, guys. Hi, I'm Richard. I'm Mintel's Senior Trends Consultant working on the consulting team. And yeah, we're doing a lot of podcasts recently and nice to be looking um, at this issue with all of you today. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Now, look, b- before we get into it, this isn't the first time that the four of us have had a talk about this topic. Science versus nature was the subject of our big conversation series, which, due to COVID-19, lives online. Um, and we talked there about the consumer drivers for using science and innovation, potential barriers like price and safety concerns and so on. Now, it, it feels to me, not just doing what I do as a consultant, but also as a consumer, that you know every brand and his dog in the past few years has been talking about the natural, the love of natural, natural sugars and natural colorings and packaging. So this is a this is a big question, I'm aware, but I'm asking it. And Rich, I'm going to ask it to you first. Why the obsession with natural products? I think consumers have associations they make with natural products that they've got great purity, that they're, they're healthy. I think there's also what they're realizing actually is a bit of a misconception that natural always equals sustainable as well. So I think there's a kind of halo of natural products, which uh, which has helped them for a while, but we're seeing that starting to be challenged a bit. Right. And is that new, that, that sort of, that halo of natural, has that always been there? Because it does feel in the past couple of years, like it's really come to the fore. I mean, I find it's become a it's like the, over the past few years, and if you go back, I guess, in food and drink, uh, 10 years, maybe 15 years ago, consumers were looking for kind of very direct claims on food and drink products like diet right. or light or low calorie that, for a bit, uh, low fat, very clear claims on pack that this was better f- for you than the normal product. Mm. Natural, I feel, has been used as this big banner halo term for this is an you know, all inclusive goodness and that it's from a natural source and it is a clean Mm. ingredient. And consumers just seem to link it with therefore being healthier and less processed. Um, That's kind of how I feel. It's been used as that banner term for this is better for you. Do you guys see the same thing? Do you see the same thing in beauty? Yeah, so in beauty, I think um, similar to, as you were saying, like about 10, maybe 15 years ago, you know, we were talking about natural in the realms of being kind of for the hippies. Mm -hmm. It was always kind of like hippies making their own soaps or, you know, uh, using natural products that were akin to beauty and personal care, but maybe didn't, weren't seen to have kind of the same efficacy as, you know, Mm -hmm. regular products. But what we're seeing now is that, it's almost this new kind of hippie lux that we're starting to see. So it's, it's natural is that luxury product and it's, it's acquiring that kind of price premium. Um, and right. so natural, as Ed was saying, it's seen as better for you and touching on what Richard said, um, there's that misconception about sustainability as well. So people seem to think it's also better for the environment, but as it grows in popularity, that's becoming less and less true. Right. Do you, do you guys think that natural is a bit of an empty term now? Because I mean, you know, you're in a supermarket, you're looking at every product, you can pick up the most vibrant looking artificial looking product. And it says on the back somewhere, you know, natural stabilizers or something like that. Do you think it's, it's been so overused that, that it's sort of become meaningless? 
Well, in um, in beauty now, we've obviously we've got the term greenwashing, uh, mm. and it's the idea that the free from claims that we see on packaging quite a lot. Um, that you know, in the EU, we're starting to create these kind of controls about what claims you can and can't use. So you can't say kind of free from um, parabens or sulfates or, um, you know, free from all of these different ingredients in certain uh, contexts. So, for example, if the products never contained that kind of uh, ingredient before. But things right. like natural fragrances, that's an area that's been a real a real bugbear for a lot of people because mm. it's always like, oh, you know, fragranced with natural because, you know, you've got these natural ingredients. But So people are saying fragrance-free, but actually there is a, a scent that comes from the natural products and that even that's being taken out uh, into terms of these eu guidelines right rich do you want to jump in on that yeah I, I think it is becoming meaningless yeah i mean let's let's look at the bigger picture i mean consumers have got a wealth of information they've got access to everything we've got activists journalists who are doing so much work to sort of undermine their confidence or make people challenge things you know we have big distrust of lots of political authority and stuff and that just runs the gamut through everything so i think it is being you know, seen as a sort of empty phrase, which consumers are increasingly going to challenge. You know, I think instead they want they they want to know. I think does this product work? You know, and does it have efficacy? You know, is it genuinely sustainable? You know, is it genuinely ethical? I think people are a lot more going to become a lot more stringent in what they want to know about things. Right. So, in some ways, sustainable sort of becoming the the new natural, or sort of replacing that that more empty word. Um, I think specifically in beauty, because of the uh, the issues around free from claims, sustainability has become kind of the next the next claim or the next kind of area to to hold on to. Um, and so mm. sustainability is kind of becoming that um, you know it's becoming a basic claim or a basic expectation from consumers, definitely. Right, Ed, were you going to jump in on that? Yeah, I think um, especially for consumers that are paying attention a bit more um, to product packaging. We ask consumers about, do you read product packaging? And quite sizable groups of them do. They're looking at labels, they're trying to understand them. And it's not enough just to have, this is natural, because they don't understand what that means, Mm. even if they thought it was healthy a few years ago. They want to see some more clarity around them, which is why you see the growth of, you know, new claims um, appearing that, that try and define natural a bit more. And a lot of them are linking to sustainability. I know we talk about things like carbon neutral a lot in our um, mm. in in these conversations, the science versus nature com- uh, conversations. Or we're seeing stuff like um, not only is this product using only natural ingredients, but the natural ingredients are also really good for the soil or really good for right. um, you know low energy usage. And so they need those wider um, claims to really you know give that maybe that natural claim its its definition. Okay, so it's natural plus or natural and something else. Mm. Um, It it would be remiss of us not to mention what is going on in the wider world at the moment. So we're recording this podcast, where are we now? End of May. So, you know, COVID-19 has been been sort of uh, in in full swing, locking the world down for for a good few months now. Um, I'm really interested in what impact that is going to have on this ongoing, evolving love affair with natural because it seems to me that consumers have, have cottoned on to the fact that actually the natural world's really scary at the moment um, and, and people are kind of fearful um, of it a little bit. Do, is that something that you guys are seeing as well? I think there is an argument that, you know, whether you call it natural or we've just made the argument that it's sustainable, there is a sort of argument that some people aren't going to be, be able to afford that. I think at the same time, everyone's been kind of living in this big sustainability experiment right now in terms mm. of you know, how we travel or don't travel and I think people are more conscious about food consumption and things like that. I mean, some people are definitely developing new skills during the COVID crisis. You know, some of that might be cooking, sort of making use of sort of, you know, um, ingredients. Some of it might even be people starting to grow their own. But, you know, we're talking about rarefied groups so not everybody has got the ability to do that. I think what might come out of this around this sort of area of sustainability is that um, this whole question about, you know, sourcing goes beyond just sourcing. It's actually people asking more about distribution. You know, are we buying products that make air pollution worse? You know, that whole synergy between sustainability and public health, I think is something people consider more and more going forward as well. Right. And uh, Ed, how does that look in food as well? 
I think it's going to take a while. Um, I think we'll get to that point where consumers are thinking more about the, the wider impact of their purchases, but I think it's going to take a while because we're predicting that COVID-19 is going to cause us to enter quite a tough recession period um, in many markets around the world. And yeah. um, when we look at that data, what happens in a recession period, consumers, effectively, they need, they've got a smaller budget. So either they shift the discounters or they, they, they have, you know, let's say we're, we had a 90 pounds to spend, you know, Six months ago, now we've only got 70 on the whole weekly shop. And what does that then mean for their purchases? And it might mean that labels and, and claims go out the window temporarily. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys feel the same way. Um, I think consumers are just going to be about getting their products that they need and feeding their families and, and hoping they can get by while this is going to go. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting, I think, because one of the things we saw in the last recession, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, from a food perspective, was actually, you know, premium brands actually doing, mm-hmm. doing fairly well. So, it, you know, moving into the whatever lies post-COVID, whether it's a recession, whether it's something else, is that something you, you anticipate as well? I guess there's an argument some of that food service spend translates into, you know, those who can afford it can, you know, premiumize more in uh, food and drinks, certainly. But yeah, I mean, of course, that's right. I mean, some people can't even afford to eat, you know, we're seeing sort of food banks become more of a fixture. There's definitely that challenge out there. I think one more thing to say about sustainability, which I think is really interesting, is this idea that through things like lockdown, through things like social distancing, I do you think you're getting a sense amongst consumers that they're, individual actions can actually have a bigger, wider impact on society and even the world. So I think that's something that might be a legacy of this for sustainability, you know, when people can afford to do things or people will still think, you know, the behavior changes they make, actually they can have a sort of wider impact. So I think that might be an important legacy of this. Right. I think it's, there's also something to be said for kind of a reframing of value and, and what value people place on different things. With the last recession, I think it was, it was almost purely economic, you know, so it was very much about, right, well, how do I get the things that I've always been buying for cheaper? This one is going to be more health driven, right? So this is, this is stemming out of a, a global pandemic. So there's still going to be a need for health. So it might not be about trading down to the most basic of mm. things because we now are starting starting to understand that, you know, there are these kind of, you know, processed foods which are cheaper. There are these things that aren't going to be good for our health. And if we're still trying to strengthen ourselves post-COVID, uh, then then there's going to be that idea of, of where that value is for a lot of people. So, for example, I go to my local supermarket. There's plenty of bread on the shelves, no problem. There's no flour to be had. Uh, mm. Everyone's thinking about, you know, they want to make the things themselves right. because they want to see what's gone into it. Um, I think there, there is that element there. So it's that kind of, it's the opportunity to reframe value, I think. Right, and it could be back to basics in terms of going back to, to natural food stuff and, and beauty products and things like that. Yeah, it's just, I think that, that element of making things yourself, it gives you that added level of control control in a time of chaos. Right. I, I want to touch a little bit on, on the science part of the, the nature versus science topic that we've got today. Now, one of the things that seems to be having a massive surge in popularity during COVID is, is science and is clinicians and it's doctors and it's the praise for the NHS. Um, is that going to last? What impacts is that going to have on, on beauty, on food and, and the wider world, this sort of this new appreciation, if you like, for the clinical yeah i think yeah you know, science seems and scientists seem pretty cool right now and if you look at their performance against the sort of bumbling performance of many politicians particularly male ones um they're looking they're looking really on it um you know kind of wish i was german right now if you look at the sort of leadership of angela merkel with her chemistry background where she explained very respectfully to germany why they were taking the measure they did the scientific modeling behind it i also read the other week that the top podcast in Germany and Austria is actually by um, the head of virology at um, the Berlin's top hospital. So that's right. the kind of world we're getting into where, you know, I think, and I think that is going to last, you know, there's a newfound respect and I think people wanting, you know, to perceive things as being proven as safe and really kind of, you know, that renaissance and wow. expertise, which we've talked about for years, this feels like a real moment for that to me. So, yeah, I think science is kind of cool and people are, you know, in their leisure time, learning about science and listening to scientists, which is great. 
Definitely agree with that. Sorry to jump in there. Um, but yeah, I think we've we've seen a real shift in beauty about how science is viewed. You know, medicated brands, for example, they used to be seen as like these things that, you know, only teenagers would need to use because they have spots or acne. And so it's kind of a bit, the marketing was always quite cheesy. Um, but I think the more that you know, we've understood science to mm. be a major part of how we understand and treat our skin, you know, and that's grown and grown that kind of layman's understanding is really growing um we've seen a lot more kind mm. of these cool scientific okay, brands so like richard was saying from germany you've got like dr barbara sturm um and she, you know she is kind of uh you know skincare advisor to a lot of the stars uh, you've got dr augustinus bader partnering with victoria beckham you've got dr jart in uh, right. south korea massive following because they've got really cool funky packaging and um, they've got you know really cool social media as well so science like you're saying is is really cool now um, and I think that had started before COVID in beauty uh, and you know it's something that we talked about maybe developing over the next five years but we're just seeing that being pulled forward by COVID definitely we're seeing that as maybe the next one or two years now. Right and Ed is that, is that similar in food? Yeah no, I just wanted to talk about one funky example because absolutely cons- um, consumers are um, well they'd already shown interest in how things were made that was definitely something that had been going for the past few years, really trying to understand origin stories, how a product is, where it's come from, how the ingredients are made, um, the expertise behind it. You look at the coffee market and all the different types of coffees that you can now buy based on how those products are made and you get a completely different experience. Um, but I want to talk about a really fun social media example um, that I actually saw on a, a friend did it with their two kids, a friend of mine. Um, they got their kids to um, take out uh, two pieces of bread each and then they asked their kids to use t- touch each one, touch a, one of the pieces of bread. And then they said, wash their hands with the 20 seconds happy birthday song, wash their hands with soap and water and touch the other piece of bread. And then they let it sit there for, I think, three or four days to see the impact of hand washing versus and how much mold appeared on the two pieces of bread. And obviously the one where the kids hadn't washed their hands, you could see the mold was considerably, um, you know, more obvious than, than the one where they had washed their hands. And it was like stuff like that that I've seen around social media where they're trying to sort of educate kids about um, what about food safety? And I think that's going to continue. Um, that I think kids have started to realise that actually they, they don't want to touch everything and they, they understand that there is a health impact to it. Um, I think that's been a big, big point over the past few months. Mm, that is some standout parenting as well. It was great. Credit to your friend. Yeah, story. I love that. Um, sticking, with, sticking with science, one term that has been bandied around so much in recent years, lab grain. Now, I see it everywhere. Consumers must see it everywhere. And it's kind of confusing because I think, at least in my mind, there was this expectation, well, you know, all food in a supermarket has got a few chemicals in it or it's probably had science involved in, in some way. So this, this concept of lab grown, what is it? Why is it good? Why should I buy it? Um, and what kind of claims are associated with it? Uh, Ed, let's go to you first. So um, you can, the idea is that you can maybe grow in a laboratory ingredients um, that um, maybe could be grown in the natural environment or maybe even something completely different that can be used as an alternative to something in the natural environment. Um, I'm not going to talk about beauty ingredients. I'll let Alex um, jump on that. But the best example that we're seeing at the moment is lab-grown meat being talked about. So the idea that you can take the the simple layman's way, take the cell of of an animal like a cow um, and grow it um, that cell in a lab until you you manage to get um, a sort of a layer of that cell base. And what a lot of the companies are doing, they're saying in patent form at the moment, is that they're then using 3D printers to print a 3D structure until you end up with a lab-grown muscle, um, effectively a steak or other types of meat that they're able to grow. Um, the idea being that you don't have to kill an animal and also what would that then do to the environment um, if you could reduce the number of animals around the world because you can grow them in, in a lab. Um, so that's the basics. I know you other guys wanted to jump in, so I'll let you guys you know, keep going with this one. It's definitely got potential. If you look at the positives around a concept like lab grown, obviously you know, it can really potentially save on resources, you know, it scores on animal welfare, as Ed mentioned. And you know, in the same way that... You know, 
get very resonant brands, you know, craft beer brands, for example, which really celebrate the city they're from. You know, there is potential to envisage, you know, mm. um, you know, urban lab-grown meat brands and things like that. I just think we have to make sure we do get those local benefits. I mean, the problem is, as always, with sustainability or or natural. You know, we've had sort of, um, you know plant-based meat alternatives being sort of faced with their environmental credentials. Then you find out that the brand's making these in America and they're all being flown into Europe. So then right away, your sustainability credentials are completely undermined. But I think mm. where they can resonate, again, is, is with localism, that kind of craft approach. Right. Um, that's really something we can push going forward. But something as extreme as lab-grown, it's going to take a while to be able to do that at affordable scale, I guess, is the challenge. Right. And Alex, lab grown in beauty, how, how does that work? So lab grown is an interesting one in beauty. Uh, I think there's a, there's quite a few kind of commonalities between us and food, uh, things like palm oil, for example, um, or just oil bases for things like soaps. We've seen um, lab grown palm oil, but mostly just, you know, a lot of it comes from an, a manipulation of um, bacteria, right? A, mi- a manipulation feeding bacteria in certain ways or feeding certain bacteria uh, to, to elicit this kind of response and this growth that you want from it. And I think that that poses some really interesting ideas in beauty. So things like being able to control allergens, for example. So being able to, uh, especially in beauty where people really worry about reactions of things on their skin. uh, And sometimes they're not sure what causes that. So they don't know what they're looking for in this ingredients list, or they don't know what they're looking for to avoid. Uh, And so avoiding kind of allergens is a really interesting topic. But I do also like um, Richard's kind of, or I I do agree with Richard's point of of things about localism. So things like carbon footprint. Um, Carbon neutral claims are things that are rising in beauty as well, because, you know, we know that, uh, again, a lot of these ingredients are kind of grown throughout the world. Uh, There are different flowers, different foliage that we really like to use as plant actives uh, in beauty that, you know, you can only get in certain areas. So the idea that we could reduce carbon footprint that way, Mm. um, but also the fact that we wouldn't have to grow anything in the ground at all. I think that could give rise to some really interesting claims. So things like land neutral or soil neutral where you know you can say we haven't had to touch the ground we haven't had to take any nutrients from the soil you know i think there's there's some really interesting ideas like experimental stuff that we could be doing right and amazing benefits out out the end of using lab grown now look i i will try anything once and i am under 30 i live in london i work in an agency to to, to all of me to, to me all of this sounds fairly interesting um and i'd give it a go but you know alex you talk about manipulating bacteria and ed you talk about you know turning a a cell into a steak it's not going to (laughs) be everyone's cup of tea is it no um it's a big problem so we asked consumers when we did this this project about would they even try it um it's only about one in three people that would even try it right um the majority still just say no not gonna have it yeah and um it basically is icky is 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 weird to have a piece of meat that's been grown in a dish and and served to you. Look, I think that we're going to see the same thing happen in this market um, that maybe we saw with, with plant based. You go back five ten years in the plant based market, it was really boring. It was all soy and it was all dry and it wasn't a very nice market. And then look where we've got to. Um, everywhere and food service does it, and and retail have got amazing examples and amazing flavors and new concepts coming out all the time. Um, right now, the companies are saying that are doing this. Like we, we've talked about Memphis Meats or Meatable as examples, they're saying that mm-hmm. 2022 we could have um, like 15 pound, 20 euro, or whatever uh, per kilo. Um, sorry for my exchange rate there. Um, 20, like per kilo, you know, we're going to get something that's mainstream. If it enters retail as a, this is a lab grown steak, it will not sell because it's weird. I think what we're going to see first is funky food service um, locations saying that we're the first to do lab grown. They'll do it in, you know, full of taste and indulgence and enjoyment, just like with plant based. And um, right. that's how we'll see it enter the market um, when we see it enter a sort of consumer market. Uh, and they'll, you know, to make, build some noise, it tastes good. It's still, you know, it's still good good for you there's no impact on your health mm-hmm. and you know that that isn't from normal meat that you would normally have so i think that that's how we're going to see it appear because there's loads of education on this because consumers are right now are like no not gonna not gonna. yeah and alex is that ick factor in beauty as well or is it more just food that you're kind of 
putting in your body. Mm, I think there's there's that saying, right? You know, you eat with your eyes. So if something looks good, you're you're gonna you're gonna eat it, right? So when when Ed's talking about a kind of steak that's from cells, people are like people are picturing that in their head, and they're picturing something that looks maybe very. Um, very regulated in form mm, it doesn't look rubbery. very natural right yeah it couldn't you know maybe the texture's <laughs> not quite there but for for beauty obviously you don't see the ingredients that go in you don't see the active ingredients mm. that go into your products mm. and so i think there's less of that ick factor um i think what we do worry about or what what beauty consumers worry about is maybe you know the idea of um it's when we when we look at things like lab grown it's the people who tend to be less enthusiastic are kind of older people uh, people who maybe feel like they've seen all there is to see in the world and they they know how this story ends because they were around when you know uh, gmos uh, there was the big furore around gmo uh, and so right. they kind of think they know how the story ends and they think that this is kind of uh, this is the same thing coming back around again so then yeah they're just they're not even interested in trying Right, yeah, I think there's, there's probably less point trying to change their minds uh, and instead it's it's more about kind of just really sticking with those young people who who think it's really cool Richard I think you you were you wanted to jump in there yeah it's just occurring right. when we talk about the echinus factor it just reminds me you know we've been talking about insect protein and, and calcium for you know the last decade and I still think that's a much more realistic thing. I think part of the argument here is, you know, we've kind of done down naturals a little bit, but, you know, new naturals is part of the solution we need to be looking at here because lab-grown meat, for example, definitely delivers on the sort of ethical uh, welfare side of things, but it is going to be expensive. I mean, if you can, I think there's definitely mm. big potential still for people to actually start to buy into things like flour containing you know insects and that being sort of baked in so you get those benefits and that way you can lose the ickiness factor mm. but then you know these things have been on the market for a while and they're not really kicking on yet but that's definitely something i feel has got a lot more credibility to sort of happen at scale and can produce that locally it can be really affordable um as well so i think new naturals alternative naturals the kind of things we talked about before insects jellyfish and things like that mm. they've all got loads of benefits and they're very cheap mm. so we shouldn't discount those options as well right and the, the sciencey stuff rich is is it as good you know is, is something that's lab grown ever going to taste as good say as 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 a steak or you know is a is a face cream ever gonna have the same efficacy when it's not sort of natural well i think it can have the efficacy certainly um Taste is, is a challenge. I mean, my experience is sort of, you know, I've not had a I've not had lab grown meat. I don't think any of us have on this panel yet. But um, you know, the the alternative burgers I've tried, I mean, to me, they really did deliver on taste. But mm -hmm. when I tried them, I kind of really went for it in terms of all the trimmings and the condiments and everything. Um, but my understanding is they're actually you know, less healthy than uh, eating a traditional version because mm -hmm. there's so much kind of uh, fat in there and sugars in there to sort of give you that taste kick but you're actually losing out on the health aspect you might be looking for right okay look final question um, we've talked a lot about science we've, we've talked a lot about lab grown i want your favorite brand or product that's currently in this space um alex i'm gonna kick off with you and beauty okay um so something i really like that uh, kind of as richard mentioned about kind of the efficacy it can actually be turned up uh, or you know improved by some of these lab grown things and some of these scientific based products mm. um so the product or the the brand that i really like is um uh, bio effect so they're this icelandic brand um and they've bioengineered this barley to create epidermal growth factor uh, and those are kind of anti-aging proteins basically that already exist in the skin uh, so rather than uh, seeming foreign like a foreign body when they mm. come into the skin the skin accepts it as its own protein so it absorbs it a lot more easily and so wow. actually that makes it yeah so it's you don't need as much uh, you know extra kind of um aqua and you know silicates etc in the product to make sure it absorbs it's it's all you know uh, very well absorbed into the skin it's really effective amazing uh, and i just love it because it makes me look young <laughs> you already look young i want to look younger we are <laughs> i want to look i want to look 18 again you're not far off alex you do yeah. already <laughs> well, I think they're having to grow parts of me in a lab for that to happen. But, yeah. In a 3D printer, we can have a second Richard. Manipulate your bacteria. <laughs> um, Ed, give us your favourite brand. Can I be really naughty and give one very small one and then one other one? Please, please, please. You can if you're quick. I'm going to be quick. 
So one, because um, we didn't talk about it and I want to talk about it, is a company called Plenty in the US, um, which uh, grow kale in indoor farms. I wanted to bring in that idea of indoor farming, that controlling the environment um, and actually without having to manipulate the ingredients themselves, the kale itself, um, mm. you're just changing the lighting and controlling the area. And what they've done with this company, Plenty, um, is that the, the, the lighting that they use has helped the kale to grow with a sweeter taste so it is not bitter. Um, so that's oh, a really wow. fancy one. So look at plenty for our listeners. Um, and then the other one, I, I've been talking about this on all of ours um, that we've done, is, is a, um, a little beer brand called Toast. Um, Alex is smiling because we've talked about it a lot. Um, and Toast use upcycled, um, basically, bread um, to make IPA craft beer. They take waste bread products um, obviously, they market it with that toast idea, you know, using mm. bread. So they've got all those lovely, sustainable um, sort of messages with their product, and then they create a beer. And recently, they partnered up with Warburton's, and we're all British here, so we're a big fan of the, the crumpet. Um, and they partnered up with Warburton's and took all the waste crumpet products and made an IPA um, craft crumpet beer, which sounds pretty amazing. Um, so those nice. are my two funky examples. One, you know, both using science in different ways to make something that delivers on taste that has all those fabulous messages as well. Nicely done. And with something like bread as well, which is, is sort of so, such a, a food staple, it's not the kind of thing you'd expect. Yeah. Um, Rich? Oh, well, I'll stay away from the expertise of food and drink in, in peace you have on the call. A couple of ones I really like, which I think really kind of harness the idea of um, I, was, I was looking at new naturals and using science to kind of replicate them and make them sort of renewable. One is, I think, bolt threads in fashion, where they've been doing things like replicating spider silk, which is famed for its strength, and using that to sort of make new threads, new materials. I think that's a wonderful example of how we can mm. use science to harness that. And then the kind of poster boy for this whole movement, if you like, um, I, I always use when I talk about this, is... Um, to be found in the aquarium in, in Tennessee, in America, and they have a resident electric eel called Miguel Watson, and they use him to uh, cool. power, their, power their Christmas tree lights every year in the aquarium. So I think that's a great example of how we can <laughs> use science to <laughs> harness you know, what nature has already given us. I think that's a good um, optimistic view of what we can do okay. in the future. Very nice. I think I am sold. Um, Look, that is that is it. We are out of time. Thank you all for your contributions and thank you everyone for listening. Make sure that you subscribe, rate and review this podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast from. If you want to know more about Mintel, who we are and what we do, head on over to Mintel.com and follow us on social media. We are on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. Until then, catch us next week on Mintel's Little Conversation. Mintel.